Above all, the best way to be a great player in Numenera, or any game for that matter, is to be there to have fun and tell a great story. If you're new to Numenera, however, it's very easy to get overwhelmed with a new system. In this video, I'm going to break down seven tips to help you create a smoother experience that avoids rule dives and keeps the attention on the characters and the story shared at the table or on the screen. The popularity of other role-playing game systems that stack modifiers on top of a die result often leads new Cypher System players to search their character sheet for what they should add after rolling. This is made a little trickier by the fact that Numenera often asks for speed rolls or intellect defense rolls and so on. Unless the GM says otherwise, the result on your d20 when you roll is the number you get. There's no need to change that number. Instead, looking at what skills you have and other possible advantages will simply mean that your rolled result may be better or worse for you. When a GM asks for a roll related to an ability pool like might or speed, it simply means that lowering the difficulty of that task will draw points from that pool not that the pool number or your edge affects the roll result. GMs who are up to the task can handle all of the math for you, as bonuses and negatives from your abilities typically result in a shift of the difficulty number by a number of discrete steps. In Cypher and Numenera, we only break out the math when it matters, when there's something at risk. We declare alterations to the difficulty before we roll, allowing the number on the die to be the number on the die, and that's that. In Numenera and all Cypher system games, skills actively make tasks easier or harder for you. There's never a need to dig through your sheet for what you should add to a roll. If you have a nano trained in understanding Numenera, any task that the GM declares related to that skill is automatically easier for you. A level 4 task to understand that a mysterious obelisk on the horizon is pinging the datasphere for information will only be a level 3 for a character trained in this field of knowledge, requiring a roll result of a 9. Often defined by criteria in your character's descriptor or type, you may have an inability in a particular field. This doesn't mean that you can't attempt a task in this category, it just means that it's harder for your character. You effectively have to roll one level higher than the difficulty task. If you have an inability, it does mean, however, that you can't aid another character in that specific task. If you're trained in a skill, your character automatically reduces the difficulty based on their experience with this area of knowledge. A level 3 becomes a level 2 for you, and a level 1 becomes an automatic success. It also means that challenges which are level 7 are now possible to attempt, as a level 7 task requires a roll of 21. Training brings the task down to level 6, still requiring a high roll of 18, but still with in the realm of possibility. If you're specialized in a skill, your character drops that difficulty level by two steps. This means that all level two difficulty tasks are an automatic success for you, and you can attempt difficulty eight tasks, as they will drop from a target number of 24 to 18. And while the Cypher system in Numenera doesn't have a set skill list, feel free to use the suggested ones on page 27 of Numenera Discovery. Skills are a great thing to go over in a session zero, where players and GMs can outline the expectations of what skills will cover, for example, defining clear use cases for something like a geography role. It also means that you can make up your own skills. For new players who are familiar with other systems, I always suggest grabbing the terms from a skill list in a game you know very well, and 90% of the time it will function as you expect it. It is very rare to find a game, even one with strict skill list definitions, where everything runs by the book. Every table I've ever played, regardless of the system, often involves some interpretation of what a particular skill should reasonably cover. The Cypher system just bakes that assumption into the game, with the exception of three skills unique to Numenera. Understanding Numenera, Crafting Numenera, and Salvaging Numenera are three skills which, unless your character type lists training in, you are assumed to have an inability with. This is done, it would seem, to tie into the intensity of the Numenera as it exists in the setting. These mystical, near-magical artifacts are so deeply complex and mysterious that they demand aptitude, experience, and knowledge to use. 
i.e. training and understanding crafting or salvaging. There is also, it would seem, a bit of balancing across the more Numenera heavy character types. Nanos are trained in understanding Numenera but have inabilities in crafting and salvaging. Rites have training in crafting Numenera but have inabilities in understanding and salvaging. And Delves possess training in salvaging Numenera but they carry an inability in understanding and crafting. In many ways, this is to prevent these character types from stepping over one another, allowing these three character types, should they all be represented in a party, to add to one another's strengths. And while crafting and salvaging are more or less straightforward, understanding Numenera can lead to some trickiness as it's not always clear what an understanding Numenera role should reward. Addressing this specific skill is a topic for another video, but it's worth having a conversation between GMs and players with what the expectation of this skill will be for the game you're going to play. I often provide the following with a successful understanding Numenera role. Confirmation that the object or phenomenon or creature studied is, in fact, a product of the Numenera. The function of a device, particularly if it's a cipher, artifact, or piece of iotum. An overall sense of danger, but enough to allow someone who's trained in assessing danger to get a clearer picture and what field of study this likely falls into, be it chemistry, physics, biology, the data sphere, or otherwise, even if it is causing a phenomena that breaks the rules of these fields. And that last point may adjust depending on how heavy the science talk in your Numenera game is. If you're leaning more into the mystical and near-magical experience, you may choose to use different terms that might mirror schools of magic and fantasy games. The intensity and robustness of skills in your Numenera game are largely up to the players and GM, and can evolve and change over the course of a game or campaign. Whenever you're making an initiative roll in Numenera, you're often rolling against the target number of a creature or character to determine who goes first. This kind of roll is often called for in combat, but it can be important whenever the stakes are high enough that determining who goes first makes quite a bit of difference. A roll result of 12 or higher, for example, would probably guarantee that your character will act before any level 4 creature or lower, unless the opposing creature has a specific modification to how they treat their initiative tasks. Because this is a scenario where the final number might be more important, initiative could be one of the few times in the cipher system where it's appropriate to consider adding numbers to your roll, breaking the first rule of this video. This approach would involve adding a plus three to your roll if you're trained in initiative and adding a plus three for every level of effort you sink into an initiative task. This can be something you do as a player, revealing your final number to the GM, or something the GM can handle by recognizing whether or not you're trained in initiative, you've spent effort, or if there are any special circumstances that would give you an asset or bonus to the role. And because you can apply effort to an initiative task, initiative order and combat scenarios can become more dynamic and grant the player the option to improve their odds of going first. Characters with healthy speed pools or high edge shouldn't be afraid to burn levels of effort for a higher initiative result, especially at higher tier play. And as a fun tip to GMs, if a player rolls a natural 20 on initiative, give them two actions on their first turn, and if they roll a 19, give them a plus one to the first roll in combat. If they roll a one, have them drop their weapon for a round. Major and minor effects allow for increased dramatic flair, but they also provide some great mechanical advantages. Their openness, however, often leaves a table stuck in a moment of deciding what to do next when the die turns up a 19 or 20. Sometimes a conversation about the environment and the nature of the task at hand might spark a new idea, but it is always great to have a list of major and minor effects ready to go for when the die turns up a satisfying 19 or a thrilling natural 20. Every character focus comes with a set of suggestions for major and minor effects, usually listed before the special abilities. Consider these suggestions as powers that trigger when the die falls on a 19 or 20, or if you have abilities that provide these effects at lower numbers such as Effective Skill, a 5th tier Jack ability that triggers a minor effect on a 14 on the die and a major effect on a 19. Page 105 of Numenera Discovery is a great place to look when building a list of possible options for minor and major effects. Have these at the ready so that when you roll a 19 or 20, you as the player can narrate the action if the GM doesn't have a suggestion ready for you. Major and minor effects also do not need to be reduced to their status effects. 
While stunning is a perfectly acceptable major effect on an attack roll, denying your foe their next action, consider adding narrative flair to explain why it happens. Consider ways in which your weapons or abilities may have unique functions that only work on these critical rolls. Disarming a foe could come from a sword that when rolling a natural 20 collapses into a whip that allows you to pull your enemy's weapon away from them. A nano whose onslaught ability taps into electrical fields could transform their body into a lightning rod and pull electricity down from the sky to deal the extra four points of damage or impair the enemy for the whole fight if they roll a critical hit. Major and minor effects are your opportunity to step into the spotlight, have the narrative lens focus on you, and to be ready for those moments, it helps to have a list of possible actions you can perform. And the beauty of major and minor effects as suggestions is that with some collaborative brainstorming with your GM, you are free to come up with entirely original major and minor effects and movesets that are unique to you and your character. GM intrusions are an essential part of any Numenera game as they're one of the primary ways that XP is distributed among the party. When the GM offers you one, it is often helpful to know who you're going to give the second XP to. The rules governing who gets the second XP, like many other rules in Numenera, are open to your judgment. But by getting into character, in however that is comfortable for you, you can get a sense of how the party dynamics are operating. Which characters stand out in the moments before an intrusion? Who helped you out during that last difficulty roll? Who does your character seem to be resonating with during this particular scene? Being ready to pass on the extra XP to another player is a great way to keep the game flowing, but it's also a fantastic motivation to stick to the narrative and reward other players in the party for contributing to the experience. player intrusions were introduced to Numenera with the publication of Discovery and Destiny. By spending a single experience point and pending GM approval, the player can swiftly grab the reins of the narrative and direct it in a way that works to their advantage, adds depth to the narrative, or allows the player to shortcut a rules process to try and guarantee that a desired outcome is made real. Intrusions can be a tricky concept to wrap your mind around at first glance, which is why viewing them as extra abilities can be a great way to make use of the mechanic while you get used to the concept of a narrative intrusion. Each character type, glaives, nanos, jacks, archive, rites, and delves, have suggested player intrusions in their respective sections of the books. Consider these like powers that, instead of costing points from your pool, simply cost XP. You can activate them, and since they're suggestions, like minor and major effects, feel free to brainstorm new ones if you find that improvising something on the spot is a bit of a challenge. On sorting out how difficult a task is, MCG designer Sean Reynolds suggests in a blog post to simply use your fingers to keep track, as difficulties are rated on a scale of 1 to 10. While this is a great tool for the GM, players can make it even smoother by adding up what eases or hinders their task. Whether or not the difficulty of the average task should be revealed is a matter of perspective, but games with beginners should often involve revealing the task difficulty for at least some challenges so that new players and new GMs can get used to the mechanics. Expect a future video on the differences between revealing and hiding the task difficulty. Anytime you're faced with a task that you have training in, plan to sink effort into, or have assets or assistance from another player, count the number of instances on one hand, starting with your right hand for bonuses that ease a task, and start with your left hand for tasks that hinder you. When you get up to the higher tiers, you'll likely have to spill over to the other hand, but to start, it's a great way to quickly communicate to the GM how far your character reduces the difficulty. And if the GM is using Sean Reynolds' method of keeping track of difficulty scores, they can easily subtract or add whatever count you give them. As an example, a second tier nano who is trained in understanding Numenera, possesses a book on the Numenera, and can sink two levels of effort toward an action, must understand the nature of a phenomenon phenomenon of the data sphere in an ancient ruin before the party can proceed safely. The GM rules that this task is a level 5, but keeps the number hidden. The GM knows the player must roll a 15 for this task, and the player counts on their right hand, training a Numenera, possessing a book which grants an asset, and is willing to spend two levels of effort. This adds up to four steps in the character's favor, and the player simply communicates to the GM that they reduce the difficulty by four. The GM asks for the roll, knowing that it is now a level one task and that any roll of a three or higher counts as a success.
And there are seven tips to gaining mastery of Numenera and the Cypher system as a player. Regardless of your capacity to memorize rules, however, the ultimate rule in Numenera and any RPG is to bring enthusiasm, positivity, and respect to the table. If you have any player tips, please feel free to share them in the comment section below, and be sure to give a like, share, and subscribe to the Infinite Construct for more Numenera and Cypher system videos.